If you would, open your Bibles to Romans 14. Romans is in the New Testament, which is the second half of your Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Now, I will tell you, I'm going to do my best today. I'm losing my voice uh, because I went to youth camp this past, past week. You see all our wonderful teenagers up there in matching shirts. Uh, it's their fault I don't have a voice today. Um, <clears throat> no, lots of singing and shouting and screaming. Uh, we had a great time at youth camp. appreciate you sending them. You really do have a wonderful youth group church. You ought to be very proud of them. I, I know I am. Um, but with that said, we're going to do the best that we can in Romans 14. Romans 14. Now, I want you to imagine with me that you have a group of people that's going to get together and create a neighborhood. They're going to create a community. And so they get together and say, all right, we're going to, for the sake of our community, we're all going to get together, we're going to live together, we're going to make this community. And they sit down and start talking about the way this community is going to look like. And some people say, you know, I really think we ought to build our community in the middle of a downtown city, urban life. That way we can walk everywhere, we can, we can walk to Starbucks, we can get whatever we want. And some other people are like, no, there's too much crime in the city, we need, to, we need to be in the suburbs so we're close enough to get to the city. And some other people just say, the suburbs are still too busy, we need to be out in the countryside where the life is just slow, we just need to enjoy life together. And they can't decide where they're going to live. And then they start talking about, well, what are we going to do with our kids when we have kids one day? You know, our kids are going to want to ride bicycles. And, and, and some of your young Gen Zers that are young parents get up and say, you know, our kids all really ought to have helmets and shoulder pads and knee pads and plastic wrap. And us older ex like I am are like, please, they don't need helmets. What are you talking about? Just let them drink out of the water hose and ride their bike as fast as they want. By the way, I'm a part of the last great generation, in case you're wondering. And so we start arguing about helmets and knee pads and whether or not we can have this or that. And some parents want to have a curfew and other parents, they let the kids have fun. And we start arguing about how we're going to raise the kids and how these things are going to take place. Now imagine you try to take all those people and you put them all in one group. And it's not just a group of similar people, but now you got different generations. And so over there on the end of this neighborhood, you got all the boomers who back in 1969 bought their house for seven blueberries and their house is worth $2 million now. My millennial friends think that funny and boomers not so much. Then you got Gen Xers. All you Gen Xers are hanging out in the cul-de-sac wondering why nobody cares about you, just kind of hanging out by yourself. And us millennials, we're just trying to convince the boomers we're not the ones eating the Tide Pods. That's Gen Z that you want. And Gen Z's over there eating Tide Pods, talk, talking about Skibbity Riz and all these other things going on. And then you got Gen Alpha over there, and they're stuck with a cell phone and iPad, and they don't know what in the world's going on in the world. Now imagine trying to put all those people together and deciding how to live together and live under the same rules and make opinions about how you're going to live. Welcome to church. That's what church is like. You have these vast generations. You have these vast people of different educations and experiences and ages, and we're all trying to come together and live and try to make the decision of how we're going to live. And a lot of the things that we try to decide on, we come with varying opinions. If you don't agree with me, let me just show you how many churches have split over simple things like what color will the carpet be instead of things that really matter. These are the issues that Romans 14 deals with. We looked at last week, the beginning of the chapter. In the beginning of the chapter, he encourages the weak to love and accept the strong in Christ on disputable matters. Now, just in case you weren't here last week, I just want to remind you of this one simple truth. A disputable matter is something that is not clear in Scripture. So if Scripture clearly forbids it, then we clearly forbid it. If Scripture clearly commands it, then we command it. But there's a lot of things that aren't forbidden in Scripture or commanded in Scripture that become a matter of opinion, that become a matter of disputable matter, And how do we approach those things that are disputable in life that aren't clearly outlined in Scripture? This is what the chapter is dealing with. Particularly in chapter 14, Paul addresses the issues of days and meat. With meat, it had to do with meat sacrifice probably to idols. That Some said, you know what, an idol is nothing, like 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 10. An idol is nothing, and what does it matter if it was sacrificed to an idol? We can go buy it, a ribeye is a ribeye, let's eat the meat. Other people would say, no, I, I, my conscience would not allow me to do that. I feel like I'm participating in idol worship when I eat a ribeye that's been sacrificed to an idol. 
So he encourages in the first part of the chapter those who are weak in their faith, those who can't eat the meat, to avoid judging those that can. In other words, not to look down upon them, not to to look at them in matters of dispute or matters of opinion as though they are not Christian or they're lesser than. Now, though, in the section that we're looking at today, he makes a shift and he starts looking at the strong. How are those of us who are strong in the faith, who understand the freedom that we have in Christ, use that freedom? How are we to approach disputable matters in the strength of our faith, particularly when we consider our weaker brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, he's going to encourage us to love one another, and that love for one another is more important than our opinions. Read with me in Romans chapter 14, verse 13. He says, Therefore... Let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in and of itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one from whom Christ died. So do not let anyone who uh, you regard... Do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbringing. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. But whatever, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So he encourages us, that those of us who are strong, to not use our freedom to destroy one another. And he said, look, this is the unloving thing to do. He reminds us again in verse 13 not to pass judgment on one another, particularly on these disputable matters. But instead of passing judgment on one another, we should rather decide. Literally in Greek, it's the same word. Do not pass judgment, but rather judge to not put a stumbling block or hindrance before another person. It's a call for us to examine how we live in relation to other people. In other words, the things that we do, the things that we approve of, the opinions that we make, how does that affect the people that live around us? And in doing so, we should resolve not to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of another person. Now, the word that he uses there for stumbling block is scandalon. It's, it's, we get the word scandal from it. Now, we're not to have a scandal or trap. It's, you know, that feeling you're walking along and all of a sudden you hit something and you, you trip, trip on it. We experienced that at youth camp this past week. We had a couple of our youth experience stumbling blocks and have some knee injuries on their path. Um, but you're not supposed to lay something out. It's going to cause a scandal. It's going to cause someone uh, to fall or trip up in their faith in such a way. In other words, we're supposed to consider how we do and what we do affects other people. Now, I have to give a little caveat here because there's one dangerous road I think we've gone down in looking at this stumbling block. This verse has been used to justify all sorts of sub-biblical legalism in other people's lives. When he says don't put a stumbling block in front of other people, he's not talking about becoming hostage to all sorts of disordered personalities. So I'll give you two great examples of this. Uh, I've heard of, of people before, I actually ran into them once when I was in college, that they would make the point that Jesus never laughed. And I said, how do you know that? I was like, you're making an argument from silence. Matter of fact, I could go to the opposite. The Bible says that God laughs in Psalm 2. And they said, but their argument was, well, Jesus never laughs, so you should never laugh in church. And so if you laugh in church, you're being disrespectful. I'm like, buddy, have you seen how God has made some people? I'm pretty sure God laughs. You know, God, God has a sense of humor. And so it says, don't 
put a stumbling block before others. It, we're not becoming subject to disordered personalities that would demand that no one could laugh, in, uh, laugh before the Lord. The other favorite one that I've read about is uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, is one of my favorite guys I read, and he talks about preaching a revival one time. He was at a church, and uh, someone, a lady in the church came up to him and said, Dr. Jones, would you address all the women in the church? They've stopped wearing stockings, and I think it's unfaithful and unbiblical for them to no longer wear stockings in church. And Dr. Jones looked at her and said, Madam, do you know where stockings originated? And she said, no, I don't quite know where they originated. He said, they originated with hookers in Paris, France. And the only reason that modern day women began to wear them is because noble women began to wear them. And why would you demand that women wear stockings when there's no such thing in the Bible? You see, if you're not careful, you become subject to disordered personalities that would demand you to do all sorts of things that have a sub-biblical legalism. But what it does mean is this. We do voluntarily limit our freedom out of love for one another. That we consider the opinions that we have and the things that we do and how they affect other people in the way that we do them. And what's interesting about it is you get through this whole chapter before Paul, halfway through this chapter, before Paul finally gives his side. Paul has been making this argument about not judging one another on disputable matters, about treating one another in love and accepting one another. And you finally get about halfway through, and Paul says, look, let me give you my verdict on this. Look what he says in verse 14. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus. And I'm just stop there for just a moment, because you have to realize how shocking what he says really is. Paul is a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's a Pharisee that has been trained in all the ways of the Pharisees. He makes a big point that had about all of his ritual cleanliness and all the things that he's done in the Lord. And Paul was such a Pharisee that he's the guy going around persecuting Christians before Jesus gets a hold of his life. Paul is the guy that you would think would be upset about dietary restrictions and following those. So what he says is quite shocking because he says, I know and I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning God has made such a difference in his life that his mind has come to be dominated by Jesus, not by his upbringing, not by his pharisaical teaching, not by the fact that he's a Hebrew of Hebrews, but by the fact that Jesus Christ is in his life has made such a difference that his mind has now been transformed by him because he says this, in Jesus, persuaded by him, that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. And it's remarkable he says this because for Paul, eating certain meats and participating in certain activities as a Pharisee would be considered unclean. But he's saying, look, knowing who I am in Jesus, knowing what God has done for me, knowing the freedom that's come in Jesus, I am persuaded that nothing in and of itself is unclean. And the point he's making is that God has not created anything unclean. This is the point that uh, Jesus makes in Mark 7, 15, where he says that it's not what goes into the mouth that makes a man unclean. It's what comes out of a man, out of his heart that makes him unclean. This is what Paul, uh, Peter experiences in Acts chapter 10. Remember, Peter's having a vision in Acts chapter 10, and God unrolls a vision before him of all sorts of meat. And God says, get up and eat. And Peter says, never, Lord, for that, those, that's ribs. Those are pig ribs on that sheet, and I can't eat that because that's unclean. God tells him in Acts chapter 10, don't call anything that I have made unclean. A great example of this would be in the Garden of Eden. You think about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree in and of itself was not evil. The tree in and of itself was good, but God set a boundary around it and said, don't eat of this tree. So it's not as though God created evil and then Adam and Eve participated in it. God created a good tree, the, not, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and, Eve had, Adam and Eve disobeyed God and participated in disobedience against the Lord. And you say, why would God do that? Well, God is sovereign and he has the right to set the rules. And particularly when you look at the Old Testament. Why did God read the book of Leviticus? Why did God not allow certain things like eating um, pigs and, and uh, wearing uh, double, uh, you know, mixed fat fabric and those type of things? Well, God is God and has the right to set whatever ceremonial laws that he wants to set, but the things in and of themselves are not unclean. The reason you have to understand this 
is that because in Christ, you and I are clean. We have been made clean by Christ. So when the material things that we approach, the material things in and of themselves are not unclean. However, we can often misuse them for evil. I'll give you two great examples. Um, I'm really glad my wife is in ETC, so she won't be as embarrassed by me saying this today. Um, So God created sex to be good. It is a good thing designed in marriage. And you're supposed to participate in it in marriage. But unfortunately, we take that good thing and we use it for evil. And so we have pornography and adultery and affairs and use it in ways that it's not supposed to be used for evil. God created it good, gave it to us as a good gift, but we use it in evil ways. Or you think about alcohol. We want to say, in the South particularly, we want to be teetotalers. But the Bible is not a teetotaling book. God has created plants. God has created sugar. God has given us this process of using these things. However, what happens is we take a good thing that God has created it, and we use it for evil purposes. We get drunk. We get addicted to it. Our personalities change. And, and, and i got to clarify this to make sure I say because I've dealt with too many functional alcoholics in my life. There are people that will start drinking early in the morning. They'll drink till late in the afternoon. And they say, oh, I'm not drunk. I'm not misusing it. Yes, you are. It's changing your personality as you drink. And so we take this good thing and use it and misuse it for evil. This is what Paul is saying. He's like, I'm persuaded that nothing is unclean in and of itself. But for the one who thinks it's unclean, it is unclean for them. And the reason why it's unclean is because they violate their conscience and they're not participating in whatever it is as an act of faith. So I'll give you a great example of this. We, we mentioned alcohol just a minute ago. So just so you know where I am, uh, I do not drink alcohol. Uh, just as a matter of conscience, I, I, my conscience won't allow me to drink alcohol. Uh, part of that is because I grew up a teetotaler. I grew up in Mississippi uh, where alcohol is, is totally the devil and you just stay away from it and whatever. And uh, so we moved to Texas to go to seminary. And we've been there for like two or three weeks, and they had announced from the pulpit that this Sunday school class was going to get together and watch a Dallas Cowboys football game after church. And they're going to have a barbecue, and they're going to have a cookout and do all these things. I'm like, oh, great, we've only been here a couple weeks. Let's go get to know somebody. Let's go do, do these type of things. And so we go, and they're like, oh, hey, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, you know, here's the food. Here's the drinks. Great. I go over. I'm looking for a Dr. Pepper because I'm a Dr. Pepper guy. I open up the, the cooler and it's nothing but Michelob and Coors and, you know, what I say, it's nothing but beer. And so instantly what I begin to think is I'm guilty of the beginning of chapter 14. I'm guilty of these people are sinners. What kind of church did I go to? They must hate the Lord. Who are these people in participating in this activity? Now, I will freely tell you, I should not have done that because those people love the Lord and follow him to this day and are some of the greatest Christians I've ever met, even though they may have had a a beer at their Sunday school gathering. Now, they would have been wrong, though, to force me to participate with them because I went to the owner of the house and said, hey, you got a Dr. Pepper, you got a Coke, you got something, you know, non-alcoholic that I can participate in. And they're like, oh, yeah, sure, come on, we, you know, we've got some stuff in the fridge that you can take care of. Because for me, I could not have participated that in a clear conscience before the Lord. As a matter of conscience, I personally don't participate in that. In doing so, no, notice what happens, what it says here. He says, look, those who consider it unclean, what happens, verse 15, if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. For by what you eat, do not destroy the one from whom Christ died. So look, don't deliberately grieve them by the things that you do. Yes, are you free to participate in these things? Absolutely. If you can do them uh, by faith to God and a clear conscience, you are free to do them. But don't do it in such a way that your knowledge puffs you up that destroys and grieves your brother in Christ. He uses an interesting phrase in verse 15 when he says, do not destroy them. The reason why it's interesting is because it includes this idea of of violating their conscience. That it is possible that God 
gives us a conscience. Conscience simply means with knowledge, that God has instilled some knowledge within us. And once we ignore that thing, that, that knowledge that we have, and eventually we can be annoyed by our conscience. We don't like our conscience to speak to us, so we suppress it. And because we suppress it, often what happens is we can sear our conscience to where we participate in other things that make us guiltier and guiltier. And so I, I, I'll give you a, a great example of this. We're supposed to be growing in godliness. We're not supposed to be destroyed in our walk with, with, with God. So at a church I was at 20 years ago, we had a, I was a youth minister there at that church, and we had a, a girl that would come to our services on Wednesday night. Now, she came from a very strict Pentecostal family, a very strict Pentecostal group. And so the family that she belonged to required her to wear the long jean dresses. She wasn't allowed to cut her hair. She wasn't allowed to wear makeup. So she would go with them on Sunday mornings, but she would come to church with us on Wednesday night. And what would happen is she would sneak some scissors, some makeup, some of those things in her backpack. And when she got to our church on Wednesday night, she would go into the bathroom. She would trim her hair. She had some blue jeans that she'd hide. She'd take off the long skirt, put her blue jeans on. She would borrow some makeup from, from some other girls in the youth group, and she'd put some makeup on. And you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, she's just, she's just you know, uh, cutting her hair. She's just wearing some makeup. She's just wearing some blue jeans. You and I would say there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with cutting your hair. There's wrong with wearing makeup or wearing blue jeans. We would totally agree with that. The problem is for her, she had grown up and she felt like and understood that every time she participated in those activities, that she was doing something she should not be doing. And so as a result of that, she would suppress her conscience, suppress her conscience, suppress her conscience. And it was a little interesting not to watch her over 20 years. This was 20 years ago. And she would tell you to this day, I mean, thankfully the Lord has restored her and, and brought her back to the faith. But over 20 years, she would tell you that that process began to lead her down a path where she would become more and more promiscuous and promiscuous and go from God to God to God because she was rebelling and suppressing the things that she thought to be right and doing the opposite of that. That's what Paul is talking about in verse 14 and 15 when he says, The one who thinks it's unclean, it is unclean to them. Do not grieve them by what you do and do not destroy your brother because by doing that, what you're doing is suppressing their growth and godliness. And so what does it matter? What does it matter? It's just a matter of opinion. What if I do those things? Notice the sting he gets here in verse 15. Do not destroy the one from whom Christ died. That person that you disagree with, that's your brother and sister in Christ, Jesus died for them. Do you think so little of them that you have to win the argument and destroy them, and yet Christ died for them? Christ gave his life for them. Who are you and I to use disputable matters to destroy them in the faith? If Christ thought them precious enough to die for, then certainly you and I can sacrifice freedom at some time in order to see them grow and mature in Christ. Now I think this is where the caveat comes in. This is verse 16. Do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. It carries two, two weights here. One is you look at something and say, look, I can eat the meat. I can participate. I can cut my hair. I can, I can have a beer every now and then. Whatever it is. So don't look what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. It carries this idea that those things on disputable matters that we work through and we talk about and these opinions that we have, we talk about them and we grow as disciples about them and we, we seek to mature in Christ about them. We have conversations about them. But what we don't do is seek to destroy our opponent. Now, I'm afraid this is what the world has taught us to do, is that you have an opinion about something that is completely disputable, and I have an opinion about something that's completely disputable. And instead of having a conversation about it, what the world has taught us is you go in your corner and I go in my corner and let's come out and destroy each other. Instead of loving each other in Christ, we, regard what we, are, we allow what we regard as good to be spoken of as evil and destroying the brotherly unity that is meant to be found in Jesus. So we're not just to destroy one another in our freedom. So those who are weak are not supposed to judge those who are strong in the faith. And those who are strong are not to use their freedom in an unloving way that destroys those who are weak. Instead, 
We're to seek God's kingdom by seeking Christ together first. Notice what he says here. You know, this is why we don't do it. Verse 17, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. No, you, you've made it a matter of whether or not you eat the ribeye or whether or not you participate in this. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. When he speaks about the kingdom of God, Paul only mentions the kingdom of God 16 times in his writing. But he means, when he talks about the kingdom of God, he's talking about the messianic reign and rule of Christ. In which God restores all of that that was lost in the fall. That we know God perfectly. We reside with God perfectly. We understand that Christ is Lord and King of kings. He says, look, that kingdom is not a matter of externals. It's not a matter of what you do externally, eating and drinking. But it is a matter of eternals. And the eternal things that matter are righteousness. Righteousness carries the idea of being justified in Christ, being made right with Him. And righteousness carries the idea of the whole person being right with God. Uh, By the way, this is the difference between morality and holiness. There's a lot of people in this world who are very moral. Morality is all about a particular action. It's about a particular thing. You, you know, good moral people don't do this. Good moral people do this. And a lot of people have boiled down all of their following of God to morality. A list of do's and don'ts. Of, of particularly do these things and do these things. Don't do these things. What's interesting about that is what I really look at is people, when you look, really look at their list, all the things that they, they say you're supposed to do are all the things that they already do well, and all the things that they say you're not supposed to do are all the things that they already avoid. They tend to ignore the other things that matter in Scripture. The kingdom of God is not about just morality. Morality is about particulars, one part, one piece. The kingdom of God is about righteousness, holiness. And the difference between Morality and holiness is where morality is worried about the part. Holiness deals with the whole person. Holiness deals with you as an entire individual and your righteous standing before God that God would make you holy. He says, look, the kingdom of God is not about these externals. It's not about just eating this meat or not eating this meat. It's not about drinking or not drinking. The kingdom of God deals with being justified before God and God making you holy. This is why the Bible would say, be holy, therefore as the Lord your God is holy. Holiness deals with you in your entirety. And if you're holy and righteous before God, then you can make right decisions about these matters of opinion. Not only is it a matter of righteousness, but of peace. So Christ has made us righteous, and because we're righteous, we're at peace with God, and we have the peace of God. And not only is it a matter of righteousness and being at peace with God and having the peace of God, we have the joy in the Holy Spirit. You notice the Trinitarian understanding that God is working in you, that Christ gives you righteousness because of the righteousness that Christ gives you. You have peace with God and the peace of God in your life. And as a result of that, you have the joy of the Holy Spirit in your life, that God is working through his kingdom in a Trinitarian way in your life. Notice what he says. Because of this, verse 18, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable God and approved by men. This is how we determine these disputable matters, that I want to make my life about the righteousness of Christ, the peace that I have with God, the joy that I have in the Holy Spirit. And when I do that, it produces in me a right way of believing and a right way of thinking. And in in doing so, I'm acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, do not for the sake of external things, verse 22, the sake of external things, I'm sorry, verse 20, destroy the work of God. Instead, keep the kingdom of God first. And it's not about my freedom and what I can do or not do. It's not about my opinion in destroying you. It's about God's kingdom. He says, look, because of that, it's good. Verse 21, it's good not to eat meat or to drink wine or do anything else that causes your brother to stumble. So there's going to be certain situations that out of love, you abstain from certain things in order to protect your brother and sister in Christ. Again, we're not going to become subjected to disordered personalities, but we're going to be subject to God in his kingdom as the reigning Lord of our life, and in doing so, realize that sometimes we'll abstain from certain things. In other matters, it's good, verse 22, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Now, when he says keep between yourself and God, he's not talking about the gospel. 
The gospel is meant to be heralded and declared. There are, way, there are way too many people who keep the gospel between themselves and God. He's not talking about the gospel. You should proclaim the gospel everywhere you go. But where he says the faith that you have, keep between you and God, that on some disputable matters, you should not press your opinions. You should keep them between you and the Lord. And instead, verse 19, you should pursue peace and the mutual upbuilding of one another. And so I'm not going to display all of my opinions out. I'm not going to make all of my opinions uh, uh, made known. It's not that I'm ashamed of them. It's that I recognize that they're disputable. And by my opinion, I don't want to destroy what God is doing in your life. Instead, I want to have peace with you because God is at peace with you and God is at peace with me. And I want to upbuild you. So this means that we have to watch how we disagree with one another. Instead of trying to destroy one another. And and by the way, Christian, I know for a fact There are a lot of things in this world that aggravate us and upset us and make us mad. I know they are. But we are not doing a service to the kingdom when we rage on the internet and we rage at one another and we seek to destroy one another at all costs. Our calling is not to destroy one another because of opinions. Our calling is to make peace and build one another up. So sometimes we have to have conversations about opinions. Hey, what do you think about this? I'm wrestling with this. I don't know what to understand. But we have those conversations in such a way that we bring peace and build one another up in Christ instead of seeking to destroy one another. The moment you set out to win an argument on disputable matters, you have already lost I see this happen all the time in marriages. You know, sometimes, a lot of times, most of the times, husbands and wives don't get along. And instead of trying to reconcile and be at peace with each other, they try to destroy one another. You're wrong, I'm right, and I'm going to prove how wrong you are. And you can stand there in your wrongness and be wrong. Y'all can tell my wife I said that later. But why would you try to destroy your spouse, this person whom you've united with, and have said that you've made a vow to love all the days of your life, and yet we do it? The same is true for your fellow church members. Listen, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you and I are on the same team. You and I are fighting for the same goal. And we may have different opinions about exactly how we get there. But why in the world would we seek to destroy one another over opinions? So instead of pressing into that, there are things that we will approach. Notice what he says here in verse 23 about how we approach him. Whoever doubts is condemned if he eats. Because the eating is not from faith. But whoever does not For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. When we approach these disputable matters, here's a good rule to approach them. If you notice, Paul has not really given a lot of particulars throughout this. Not even throughout Romans. He's just generally said, look, hate evil, love good. This is how you live life. Just go out there. If it's evil, hate it. If it's good, love it. But here's how we do and live in these disputable matters. If it's disputable, if it's a matter of opinion, can we do it out of a clear conscience? In other words, with our knowledge that we have and our understanding of God, can we have with a clear conscience participate or be involved in whatever it is? Not only can we do it out of clear conscience, can we do it out of faith? In other words, can we look to God and say, God, I know that you're the king of the universe. I trust you in all things. I'm obedient to you in all things. And this thing I'm doing, I'm doing out of faith, trusting in you to your glory. If you can do it with a clear conscience, out of faith to God's glory, then go do it. If you can't, don't. But whatever you do, seek to do it in peace, building up one another in Christ. The whole point of this is that love for one another 
is more important than our opinions. Listen, I have opinions about everything because I'm a human being, and I'm sure you do too. If you want to know my opinion, just ask me. We'll sit down and have a conversation about it. But as strong as my opinions are, my love for you in Christ is more important. At some points, my faith is strong, and it allows me to participate in things, disputable things. At other points, my faith is weak, and I can't participate in them. But whether or not you agree or disagree with me on disputable matters, what matters at the end of the day is you are my brother or sister in Christ. We have to get past believing that our opinions are the most important thing and start believing that the kingdom of God is the most important thing. And if you'll follow him, all those other things will be worked out. Now, if you're not a believer, you're not here, I understand how some of these things might sound foreign to you. Because the entire system of the world is built on this idea that you have your identity and your opinions and if someone disagrees with you, your goal is to destroy them. That's why we see the violence we see in the streets. That's why we see the riots. That's why we see the things that we have. That's that's why we're so polarized as a nation today is because we come to matters of opinion and we've, we've gone to our corners and we've come out swinging. But I hope you hear me today. What unites believers in Christ is not some kumbaya, all feel good, lovey-dovey, hope we all get along attitude. If that's the case, we're all going to hate each other pretty soon. What unites believers is the one simple fact that Jesus paid for my sins. And if Jesus paid for your sins then you and I are in the same family and we're united in Christ. Jesus is the only one who brings people together. And if you're not a believer, if you don't trust in Jesus, you'll never understand how you can have true unity with somebody else who's just different from you. How a millennial, how a boomer could get along with some Gen Zer going skibbity riz down the road. But the only way we do that It's because Jesus paid for the boomer's sins, and Jesus paid for the Gen Zer's sins, and they're united in Christ. My hope for you today is that you find the grace and forgiveness that we have found in Jesus Christ that brings us together as one family. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your time together. Lord, I do pray when it, when it comes to matters of biblical faithfulness, we will stand solid. We will, we will not waver. But that when it comes to matters of opinion and disputable matters, you will teach us to lay our opinion down for the sake of loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether we're weak in the faith or strong in the faith, May we all be united in Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing, would you...